In my first talk on non-invasive ventilation, I talked about the principles and management of NIV. In this second talk, I'm going to talk about indications and I'm then going to go on to talk about NIV failure. What does that mean and what does that look like? Why is this important? The National Reporting and Learning System, NRLS, for incidents, reported over a four-year period. It identified 197 cases where problems with NIV caused at least moderate harm. So it's not a benign intervention, and if we're delivering it, we need to know that what we're doing is likely to render the patient benefit. If we look at the indications for NIV, there are two that are very clear. Acute exacerbation of COPD and pulmonary edema. There are a number of other cases where NIV has been used with varying effects. Immunocompromised patients, hypoxic respiratory failure, acute lung injury as a means of weaning from mechanical ventilation, in cases of extubation failure, in post-operative respiratory failure, in acute exacerbations of interstitial lung disease, in asthma, in cystic fibrosis, in trauma, and in patients who have a DNAR or DNI form. I think it's always important to ask one question when instigating NIV. What are you going to do if it fails? Are you going to intubate the patient? Are you going to resuscitate the patient? The answer to this very important question guides a number of things. One, it guides the setting in which you deliver NIV. And two, it guides your communication, your communication with the patient, your communication with the family, and your communication with the wider MDT. For example, if you would intubate the patient, is it wise to give NIV on the ward if you're uncertain that it's going to succeed? The role of NIV in acute exacerbations of COPD was subject to Cochrane review in 2004. The findings were essentially found so compelling that the review has not been repeated since. NIV improves pH, PCO2 and respiratory rate in the first hour. It decreases the intubation rate, relative risk 0.4. It decreases complications, relative risk 0.4 again. And it decreases mortality, relative risk 0.52. The numbers needed to treat to save one life is 10. There are very few interventions with an NNT as low as that. So we know that NIV works in acute exacerbation of COPD. The results are equally valid when analysed by severity. If you look at intubation, when the pH is uh, over 7.3, the odds ratio is 0.5. When the pH is below 7.3, the odds ratio is still 0.4. Looking at mortality, with both the pH above or below 7.3, the odds ratio is of the order of 0.5. What about even sicker patients? Well, in a Squadroni study, uh, there were 64 patients with acute exacerbation of COPD where the admission pH was below 7.25. They were matched with historical controls who received mechanical ventilation within the same two years and the same exclusion criteria. And this is what the graphs look like. The y-axis represents the percentage of patients being ventilated, be it mechanically through an ET tube or via NIV. You can see from the top graph that those that received NIV got themselves off ventilation quicker. The graph below, however, shows a slightly more nuanced story. 
when NIV works, it works quickly. However, when NIV fails, there is very little or no difference between those that were initially intubated and those that had a trial of NIV. NIV failed in 40 of the 64 patients and they all required intubation. This was a study that was done on an ICU. Reflect whether the same can be said of your setting. What about patients who are even sicker? So this was a Brazilian, I believe, study looking at patients with hypercapnic respiratory failure with low GCS. They looked at patients who had a GCS less than 8. 80% of patients responded versus 70% of patients where the GCS was greater than 8. There was no difference in mortality and the improvement in GCS in the first hour predicted the outcome. You would need to be something of a brave soul to offer NIV to patients with a GCS less than 8. What about the role of NIV in acute pulmonary edema? In this Lancet paper of 2006, CPAP versus standard therapy reduced intubation in acute pulmonary edema with a number needed to treat of seven, and CPAP versus standard therapy reduced mortality. If one considers bi-level NIV versus standard therapy, it again reduces intubation and there's a trend to reduction in mortality. What's interesting is to compare CPAP to bi-level ventilation there is no difference in either the need for intubation nor in mortality. This is interesting. It is often possible to offer CPAP in settings other than ITU. Hypercapnia in pulmonary edema is not necessarily a sign of respiratory failure. Wherever possible, one should consider offering CPAP. What about NIV in asthma? Well, here things get difficult. Asthma really represents such a spectrum of disorders that when one looks at the papers, one isn't necessarily comparing apples and oranges, but really apples, oranges, grapes, bananas, an entire fruit basket. It's difficult. Of four reasonable papers concerning asthma, there is one that I would like to look at further. Gupta and Al from Respiratory Care 2010. Gupta and Al looked at standard medical therapy versus NIV. Four patients from the standard medical therapy arm moved over to NIV, while one patient in the NIV group moved to standard medical therapy. Two patients in the NIV group found themselves intubated. There was no difference in improvement of physiology. There was perhaps a trend towards more rapid improvement in the primary outcome, which for them was 50% improvement in FEV1. There was reduced bronchodilator to use in the treatment arm. Perhaps this means that NIV helps to deliver salbutamol more effectively. There was reduced ICU and hospital length of stay in the treatment arm. What about the role of NIV in acute respiratory failure? Well, this paper from 2003 suggests ITU mortality is reduced when NIV is used over oxygen alone. However, the findings are not statistically significant. Fewer patients do find themselves intubated in cases of acute pneumonia. But look how common treatment failure is. When oxygen and NIV is used, still 25% of patients find themselves intubated. When NIV is used in cases of community-acquired pneumonia, you can see that the risk of NIV failure remains high. An extra challenge is that it looks as if NIV causes harm 
if it delays intubation. Look at this paper from Esteban uh, and then Wood. In those that required intubation, there was lower mortality in those that had previously received oxygen alone over those that had received oxygen and NIV. There does seem to be an exception, and that is in cases of pneumonia in the immunocompromised. Words such as respiratory dialysis have been bandied around as, as the role of NIV. Acute hypoxic respiratory failure associated with fever and infiltrates is common here. There is a worse outcome still in those that are also neutropenic. This paper by Hilbert looked at the role of NIV in those who are immunosuppressed. In those who received oxygen and NIV, treatment failure was less likely and in-hospital mortality was also reduced. Both were approaching statistical significance. In the Hilbert paper, the relative risk for being intubated was 0.6. The relative risk for death was also 0.6. You actually tended to do better if your immunosuppression was from haematological malignancy rather than drug-induced. When one looks at the role of NIV in fibrotic lung disease, this is very much a work in progress. This paper from Gunga and Al was a retrospective analysis. It, it divided patients who required NIV constantly versus those who were able to take it off for short periods for comfort, eating, etc. Those who weren't welded to their NIV mask were less likely to require intubation and more likely to survive. Looking at NIV in postoperative respiratory failure, Postoperative pulmonary complications are common. They affect 5 to 10% of all surgical patients and up to 40% of those having abdominal surgery. However, there are a myriad of respiratory problems that can occur, and so it's perhaps not surprising that a clear role for NIV hasn't been established. However, looking at thoracic surgery, Prophylactic use of NIV improved lung volumes and improved oxygenation. It reduced intubation and length of stay in ITU. In cardiac surgery, prophylactic use of NIV improved oxygenation. However, here there was no difference in ICU or hospital length of stay. NIV failure. The expectation from starting NIV is that physiology will improve within one to two hours. There should be an improvement in pH, a fall in PaCO2 and a fall in respiratory rate. Patient selection is important and you're setting yourself up for NIV failure in patients who are confused or have impaired consciousness. When illness severity is higher, when there are copious secretions or the patient has pneumonia or even ARDS. Patients with poor nutrition or no teeth are also going to be less tolerant of NIV. NIV success, on the other hand, is more likely to be seen in patients who have a less severe AA gradient, who have a good GCS and generally who are younger, those with Apache scores less than 20 and those where it's possible to achieve minimal leak around the interface. I refer back to my previous question, what are you going to do if NIV fails? Because it may be that in some cases it is simply better to go straight for intubation. In order to maximise NIV success, you need to choose the correct interface. 
you need to introduce it slowly, keeping both the patient and yourself calm. Start with the pressures low, but then titrate up to close to the maximum tolerated relatively quickly. You should wean an IV on time, not on pressure. This is in contrast to mechanical ventilation using an ET tube. You should also always understand what the alternative is for the patient. Are you going to intubate them if they tire? Are you going to introduce palliative measures? This slide shows the variety of NIV interfaces that are available. That's the end of this talk. As always, if you have any questions, do simply find me or my email address is on the screen. And here's a variety of references that you may find helpful.